Good morning from Gemini Gallery. Happy Amazing Monday. I'm Linda Card. This is Dave Andresen, and we have Randall again. <clears throat> this is one of Dave's pieces that is here at Gemini Gallery. So Dave, you want to tell us about your process? Sure. Um, it starts with a photograph or a couple or two or three photographs because there's the images are usually a composite. Um, this photograph is based on a little black and white snapshot that I found of this. What do you call these things now? Billboards. Billboards. Yeah, over in Old Trail Museum, and um, I also at the same time found a photograph of the police car. And I thought, how cool would that be? Do a painting of this and put the police car behind it. So to get the composition all adjusted so I can do the painting, I scan the images and in Photoshop computer program, I remove the textures and the colors and essentially leaves me with a line drawing. So I have a line drawing of the billboard with the, with the landscape background and a line drawing of the car. Now in that computer program, to be able to use these as composites, put them together moving around without one covering up the other one, I have to render part of those images transparent, which we can do with, with the computer program. So I decided which images and which parts of the images become transparent, then I layer them in the order that I want, and I start moving them around and I can also independently size each part of the image until I get the composition that I'm happy with. And then I print it on watercolor paper and then I go to painting. Um, I use acrylic paint and I paint with it in the, the method as if I was painting with uh, tempera, which is one of the two mediums that I learned in, the, in art school years and years ago. <clears throat> and Tempera is ideally suited for painting fine detail. And um, so it's painted in many, many layers of transparent and semi-transparent colors until the um, it's built up to where you get the desired opacity. Um, some areas in here, you may have um, 10 or 15 layers of paint. Oh, so it's nearly, really, really, nearly transparent. Yeah, yeah, the paint is just as, as transparent as watercolor. You know, to get opacity in watercolor, you usually have to add something like gouache, which is a which is a more opaque um, medium. But gouache has um, trying to not sand it, so a little bit of clay, liquid clay mixed in with it that makes it opaque. Um, you don't want to use too much because it affects the texture. Is difficult after you get a few layers of gouache to paint with really fine details. So um, areas like this where the white, where the white um, letters in Winslow, Arizona, if you've got anything bleeding through, you might want to put a layer of white gouache there, maybe put a little bit of white gouache in the yellow. Um, that helps you not go 10 or 12 layers, you may only do three or four layers to, to get that opaque. And, and the beauty of, of that is like colors like the yellow and the orange really, really glow because the light goes through the painting and hits the white background and comes back through. And you can um, see parts of the sand behind the plants down here shining through and stuff like that. And also if you um, use really, really tiny brushes to paint like little details in the car, um, oil paint almost gets too thick to do that kind of work with. So you need something that flows off the brush very, very easily and sticks to what you're painting with. So this is the beauty of acrylic. It has a sticky medium and it flows readily and and it's um, non-toxic, no smell. You know, I, I, over the years I developed allergies to the oil paint solids. You know, I really love painting with oil painting. Um, 
you know, in bigger paintings you could do stuff like this, but unfortunately I can't be around painting paint thinner and stuff like that anymore. So you talked about art school, and I know your history, and that it has a very interesting background, so tell us more about that. Well, my first um, college experience, I had the regular college experience. I went to Jacksonville University in Jacksonville, Florida, and I studied classical methods of painting as well as drawing, printmaking, um, some pottery. I had that whole smorgasbord of, of fine arts edu studio education, but what I really fell in love with was painting. I just had a, a facility for it, which the, it's, the, the professor, it was Steve Lotz, um, who had studied in Europe, um, I forgot the name of the academy, as he called it, that he studied at. Um, he knew everything there was to know about oil painting and temperate painting. and. Um, and I was thrilled because they would give us um, 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 like for instance uh, an example of things that they would to teach to learn they would give us a little problem to solve like I had a piece of white granite that, I had, that an art teacher in high school had given to me about yay big white with black specks in it and I used that a lot because they, they would say, okay, bring in something that you like and sit in front of you and do a, what they call a rendering, you know, rendering. Um, and they would limit what uh, materials you could use, like, okay, start off with um, gray paper and have a white pencil and a black pencil, or uh, white ink and, and white temper paint. And make a rendering of that object and make us believe it's real. And for a test, they said, okay, do this, but you only got an hour to do it. <laughs> and, but, so I would do that at home. I would just put things in front of me and draw them and, and rent it, use different mm -hmm. materials. And I, I really loved the white tempera and the black ink. And so after the, university, what did you do? Um, after, well, I didn't finish school there, so I left there and I moved to Tallahassee and I worked for graphic art and print shops for a while and I learned um, a little bit about commercial art. They, there were no commercial art classes at, at GU. So I learned the opposite end of because the they're art quite field. Different. Yeah, they are quite different. But, but it also it opened up a whole new world, you know, graphic arts and I fell in love with doing mechanicals, you know, making making the mechanicals that a printer would use to print that piece of art that you had envisioned in your art. And it's a lot like putting this image together, but you're doing it the old-fashioned way with ruby lift and knives where you cut the shapes out. Because, you know, the photographer would take that image into the darkroom when they photograph. You know, they become their negative, the burn plates, and you'd stack those together to create your image. Mm -hmm. A lot like what graphic artists do today, but they use computer to do it. Hmm. Uh, so, so after that, what did you do? After that, I joined the Navy, and I, I kind of traveled the world, and I got introduced to the technical photography. You know, I went to um, the Air Intelligence School at Lowry Air Force Base. Even though I was in the Navy, and I got to spend six months on air. <laughs> that was fun. Um, and so, of course, when I got to Europe, I bought cameras and I took lots of pictures and traveled a lot. And while I'm in the Navy, I went to, I would take classes whenever I got a chance, you know, photography classes or this kind of art class or that. And I took up um, silkscreen printing and then got into photo silkscreen. So that reinforced my ability to do a mechanical, you know, take an image apart and then put it back together in a, in a different method. And so over the years, um, all of these things I learned, you know, in, including when, when I got out of the Navy, I, I went back to college and finished my degree. And I added a concentration of photography to my degree. So now I've got all of these elements that I used in my head here. 
And so over the years I've used them like I did photography, I did silkscreen, I did just painting, I did a lot of abstract expressionist painting um, after my Navy days when I went back to college. Um, and I never actually worked as an artist making money. I did a lot of somewhat related things to make a living. So when I retire, now I'm free <laughs> to just <laughs> do art. You know, there's no more pressure about, okay, are you going to make a living at it or can you? I don't have to, but now I can just, just enjoy being able to create. And it's funny how things with no, no pressure, you're, you kind of like blossom in your art. And you also have a history, um, work history, working in special collections. Tell us a little bit about that. I worked at the University of North Florida after, after I graduated and I taught school for a year. I didn't, didn't like teaching school, so I... <laughs> you taught kindergarten. <laughs> no, I taught junior high art. Junior which high, was, okay. Which was pretty, <laughs> pretty much like kindergarten. <laughs> but, but it, um, it was a rough experience, but looking back at it now, it was a good experience because I realized I, I liked teaching, but I did not like high school, that junior wasn't high school trait. kids. <laughs> so, um, Randall and I both have teenage daughters in that age range, we understand. Yeah. <laughs> I had worked in the library um, while I was adding my photography concentration to my degree. And so I went back there and, and was able to get a full-time job. And after being there a few years, I transferred down to technical services. And I got introduced to <clears throat> conservation and preservation. And, and at UNF, I was mostly involved in preservation, which was involved with um, restoring books mending books, um, learning all different methods of book binding. So we had a, actually a sub-department in there which was the bindery which I ran. Um, so I, I was hands-on book repair and everything related to book repair and then liaison to a commercial bindery where we sent all books out in journals that, that were commercially bound. And when I left there I went actually into the printing field. I worked as a printer for a few years, moved to Maine and then worked in a special collections in a university, University of Southern Maine, um, where I learned the conservation side. You know, I talked about preservation and conservation. It's a museum, li library, special collections work. Um, conservation, we're mostly concerned with housing and organizing the material. Which has brought you here, then working next door at the Old Trails Museum, doing similar things, right? And the Old Trails, I'm doing conservation and a little bit of preservation, which, which was pure serendipity for me. When I, I moved to Arizona, I moved to Camp Verde, and I end up in Winslow five months later. Um, I don't want to get into that; it's a long story, but. Here I am in Winslow and I'm here for a few months and I hear about Old Trails Museum. They're needing volunteers and I'm, I'm looking to meet people and if I need something to do, I'm, I'm getting kind of bored. I'm, not used, I'm still used to Monday morning get up and go to work and work till Friday. I'm in that mood, that frame of mind still. So I go to Old Trails and I volunteer and when I told the director what my background was, she looked at me like, I just landed from Pluto, you know, where, where did you come from? It was, I had skills that they were needing. And, and I was thinking, these, all these skills I had were just, were just going to dwindle away. I was never going to use them again, you know. And I was thinking, well, what a waste. Because there's really some really specialized skills that you learn in, in these fields. So, so it's been eight years now. And, We've completed a major project at Old Trails Museum. Um, and it's funny that Old Trails Museum is right next door to this, this gallery. So coming to, to Old Trail kind of brings me downtown a lot. So I found out about things like the um, Art Council. Um, Art Council indirectly got me 
to this gal, mm -hmm. you know, their second set of art. And um, so every now and then I'd, I'd go to the art council meeting to see what was going on with arts in Winslow. And one of my big um, pet peeves was no art gallery at <laughs> Winslow. It almost led me to leaving Winslow. There was no art gallery. I got to the point about the time second Saturdays were starting, this, you know, if I really want to show my art, because I'm, I'm thinking now the quality is up to where it should be shown to the public, you know, I'm, I'm happy with showing it. Um, but there's no gallery here. Um, that means I could um, get artwork in galleries in Flagstaff or Cottonwood or Sedona or the Valley down in Phoenix, but that means a lot of driving, so just probably just want to move. Um, and that was going on in my mind seriously for about a year, and then I decided to go to the Art Council. <laughs> and I would bring up this subject, okay, why don't we get a co-op going? And maybe get the city, the Bacchus, or stuff like that. And then I find out, well, somebody's opening an art gallery. <laughs> <laughs> Guess who? <laughs> and here we are. What is it? Almost two years later. Almost. Mm -hmm. and, and you're still open, and more things are happening. So, and I'm still here. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you've been working on some new pieces that aren't automotive art. Yes, I have. Give us a little clue about what you're doing. Well, when I moved here, I was going to be the reincarnation of Georgia O'Keeffe. <laughs> we a, all have aspirations a, for that. A rather rude awakening along those lines. <laughs> and, um, it was actually here in Winslow, my first summer, I came downtown and there was a hot rod car show down here. I, said, <laughs> I took a bunch of pictures and I went home and I was looking at him and said, well, the heck with landscapes, I'm going to paint cars. And, uh, but I never forgot landscapes, because the landscape in Arizona is what brought me out here. And uh, I'm going to show you a piece that I did when I was still living in Jacksonville in the late 90s. And I took a trip out here summer vacation, went to the north rim of the Grand Canyon and, and took a bunch of photographs. You know, when I got my first copy of Photoshop, a few years later, I started playing with it and, um, wow. <laughs> yeah, and this originally was, um, this is just like a section of a photograph that had the colors were really, really off. It was a slide and it was yucky. So I took the colors out and I said, well, I'm going to play with duotones. I know what they are, you know, just add spot colors or overall tones to photographs. And I was thinking all those colors I saw in Arizona. So I said, you know, the oranges and the reds and the pinks and the purples. And came up with this. I had bought a large format printer from Epson, one of the first ones available for the public back in, I think it was 97, 98, it cost almost $2,000. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I ate a lot of rice and beans behind that <laughs> printer. And, um, it printed with with the old dye inks, what they call dye sublimation. And when I print on paper like this rice paper or drawing paper, the, the inks bleed. And I, I just loved it. I just, just, unfortunately, I kept this print, kept it in good condition. So I would get it out every once in a while. So I'm, I go to Arizona, I'm gonna paint landscapes like this. And I, and I have, I've actually gone back to digging out a lot of the photographs I've taken while I'm, while I, before I moved here and after I moved here and, and looking at them again in a, now in a different way. I think doing this kind of thing actually kind of freed my mind of this for a while. So when I went back to it, I had almost like a clean slate. You know, 
to me it's more about the colors than trying to be George O'Keefe. <laughs> Yeah, Which brings me to my yeah. next question. Yeah. One of the things that yeah. is very noticeable in all of your pieces is your use of color. Mm -hmm. Explain what you're doing. Well, color, um, I got introduced to theories of color while at Jacksonville University. I, I picked up a book that was written by, I think it was Hans Hoffman. A German painter, and he was a colorist. He did a lot of experiments with color, interactions of colors, and perception of colors. And um, while I was doing this work with, in Photoshop, um, adding the duotone colors, you can you can you can go up to four colors in, with Photoshop if you have a printer that prints with the CMYK printing colors. You can have you can put four colors. You can um, in a black and white image. You can get some pretty wild colors, and you can get you can create some colors that almost look real. But um, so in the process of figuring out just how do I pick a color to put into an image, um, I, I came across books in a bookstore on the psychology of color. Ooh. You know, color affects um, our mood, you know, how we first perceive color, you know, we get a reaction from it. Um, and this is something that commercial artists study, you know, when they're doing uh, artwork, you know, to help people buy stuff or they're promoting a customer's line of whatever they're selling and the customer says, well, this is the image we want to project and part of that is is the colors they use because the colors affect our psychology, how to react to it. So I would look through these books that had all these color combinations, thousands of them, and I had a little tool that you could just, it was like the old Hoffman experiments again, you only see those colors. You don't see them in the relation to their, what's around them because that affects how you see color too. So you have to really isolate those colors and then the book would explain to you this color combination will will make people think about this certain to get them like this certain frame of mind like like that's very bold or that's ornament, ornamental or that's oriental or this is hateful or that's happy you know things like that and um, so I if I came to an image like this and said, I really want to make this attractive. I want people to feel what, like it says, welcome. Go to that book and says, okay, welcoming color combinations. And I said, okay, turquoise, orange, yellow, all put together, very warm, happy, well, welcoming colors. And very Southwest colors too. Yes, exactly. I was just <laughs> just going to say, yeah, the, the ground around here is very, the color is very welcoming. It's this bright, warm, red orange. And the sunsets out here and the sunrises are just like no place you've ever been before. Um, so that's psychology of color. So, so I, in a way, I, when I was doing abstract expressionist work, I was mostly a, a colorist. And then right behind that would be texture, and then composition was, well, that just kind of happened. <laughs> it's a lot of fun yeah. to reorganize the gallery with Dave because we play with color a lot on the walls and with different pieces and interacting with the light and all of that. Uh, yeah, do you have an interesting way of organizing the gallery <laughs> that? You know, when I talk about composition and organizing, I, I come from probably the, uh, the other direction. And, you know, I learned composition by looking through the viewfinder of a camera. I never learned that in art school. That was like a subject that was a mystery even to the instructors at the schools. But the viewfinder of a camera will really make you look at that image because mm -hmm. the instructor I had teaching one of my photography classes, and this is what he would tell us, you're, you're responsible for every square inch of that image. Every little, mm -hmm. every little square centimeter of it is gonna be printed and you can't hide it. And I took one class that lasted for an entire season and all we did was um, 
shoot 35 millimeter film and we had to print the image, the complete image. We couldn't crop anything. And we used um, negative holders to put in the enlargers that were filed away. So you actually saw the clearer edge of the negative. That mm -hmm. showed up in your print. So that way he knew you weren't cheating. And um, that was good experience. Excellent. So, and when I come into a place like this, you know, when I when I start thinking about adjusting elements, I'd still go into that frame of mind. Everything is in a rectangle, and I got in that rectangle, everything's got to be balanced. In this rectangle, everything has got to be balanced. And it goes on in, in this art because the painting is a rectangle, and I do that. Okay. Very Mondrian. We balance and um, Mondrian, yes. Um, but my theory that that I'm actually using when I'm doing that is called, um, <laughs> I can't remember <laughs> it now. Um, it's all based on negative and positive space, mm -hmm. space and shape. So every element in there is a shape and it affects the elements next to it. So when you move one piece, you affect the other. So everything has to be moved around until you get this nice balance of positive and negative. And note them, that's the, that's the theory that notum, N-O-T-A-M. Yeah. Anything else that you would like our viewers to know about you or your art? Well, I used to, when I first got into painting and you got to sign your name, I, I used my middle name, Thor. <laughs> and I, I learned to sign my name in Nordic ruins. and. Um, so now in my landscape paintings that I'm, I'm doing at home, um, Linda's seen a couple of them. I'm still, they need some work. <laughs> um, I'm, I don't normally sign these paintings. Um, I don't know why, it's just thinking to put my whole name on there someplace affects the composition or something, but. Um, he does initial the back. The though. back, yeah. And then he puts his. My, the name and all of that in the back. And my signature DA, but the landscape paintings um, are being signed with the name Thor. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the artist formerly known as Thor is, <laughs> is painting again. <laughs> okay, yeah. well, thanks for watching yeah. today. And check out Randall's website at morethanacorner.com. And you can find Gemini Gallery on Facebook and on Instagram, Gemini Gallery AZ, and WinslowAZArt.com.